Our next speaker is a keen observer of animal movement, not as a biologist, uh, but as a designer of robots that can move with grace, speed, stability of role models such as the cheetah. Amir Patel is a robotics researcher with over 14 years of experience in both industry and academia. He is currently an associate professor in UCT's Department of Electrical Engineering, as well as the director of the African Robotics Unit. His research involves studying the maneuverability of robotic and biological systems, such as the cheetah. He has held visiting positions at Carnegie Mellon University and John Hopkins University. Some of his accolades include a Google Research Scholar, for which he is also one of the first two African recipients, two Oppenheimer Memorial Trust Fellowships, a MathWorks Research Award, for which he is also the first ever African recipient, and the National Research Foundation Emerging Research Award. He is currently a visiting professor in the Department of Computer Science at the, Depart in, at the, in the Department of Computer Science at the University of Oxford, hosted by Professor Andrew Markham, and we flew him all the way from the UK to come and address you this morning. Amir, I look forward to hearing you. Of course, I told them earlier that Amir grew up here in Cape Town. I mean, I just get amazed by stories of young people who, uh, in fact, are past had decided that they will become nothing, and they rise from the dust, and they do what Amir is doing. Hi, good everyone. Uh, thank you so much to Prof. Heti for flying me away from the cold and into the sun. I'm very grateful. Um, so yeah, thank you for that wonderful introduction, and, and, uh, and also thank you to everyone for attending. Um, I hope that you find my talk interesting, and I uh, would love to speak about it more at the end. So, um, <clears throat> Today I'm going to talk about my research, which is on, we study cheetahs as a model animal in order to build the next generation of robotic systems. And I guess what the real title should be is how I became an accidental biologist. So, um, so what I want to talk about first is the concept of maneuverability. So um, if, we, if we're ever going to be able to move robots out of our laboratories, out of the safety and uh, really um, you know, ease of our labs, we need to be able to think about how our robots can maneuver. So things like accelerating, turning, you know, uh, jumping are going to be needed when they are out in an unstructured, you know, unpredictable world. So it's really interesting because it's, it's, a, it's a set of competing requirements from an optimization perspective. So a robot you know, wants to worry about not, wa not knocking into things or not breaking its legs in order to do a maneuver. It wants to use the least amount of power. It also needs to be robust because we can't predict everything out in the world. Uh, and then it also, obviously, in order to maneuver, it needs to be agile. So what I found when I started my research is that it's actually quite sparsely understood and studied in robotics. So we're really all interested in, you know, making robots walk or making... You know, it was a time a couple of years ago, everybody was trying to make the fastest robot. Um, but we're not really thinking about maneuverability. But animals, when we think about it, are extremely adept at doing these maneuvers. Um, but even so, biologists are still not clear how they are able to maneuver in such an amazing fashion. So I always like to start off with this. This is sort of how I started my journey, is that the cheetah is really the pinnacle of maneuverability. And these are just some videos that my, my group has captured. You can see, you know, really incredible ability to turn and accelerate, you know, in an unstructured environment. It's sliding, there's dust, um, really amazing. So what I wanted to do when I started my PhD way back in, in 2012 uh, is I wanted to look at biology and then build, you know, the next generation of, of robot uh, here in South Africa. And, and my hope was that I could do this by building off you know, a wealth of data on motion and models and understanding, but to my dismay, <laughs> that data was non-existent. Um, so at the time I thought, what if me as a roboticist, I could use my techniques and knowledge to help us understand animals so I could use robotics to provide insight to biology. So, so that's what we do in my group. We, we use the cheetah 
as one of the animals uh, to study maneuverability, and we study it through this lens of techniques that things you, uh, people usually do when they're trying to build better robots. So things like physical robots, modeling and simulation, optimization, we also build real robots, and then lots of machine learning, which I'm sure you guys all know uh, quite a bit about. So in my PhD, um, I developed a robot called Dima, which comes from Leha Dima, which means flash of lightning in, in uh, Sutu. And we investigated how the different motions of the tail, which I could only observe in, na in National Geographic or you know, BBC documentaries, affected a, a body in motion. So we showed that when the cheetah turns, it flicks its tail in the roll axis, it's able to turn much better. You can see the top left there. Um, when it needs to stop, it can flick its tail in the pitch axis, you know, sort of like over its head. And then we also discovered a, a, a new motion, which is called a conical motion, sort of a combination of the two, which helps it turn for longer durations. Oh, okay. Okay, so what about the cheetah tail? So if I ask anybody in this room, and if we ask any sort of game, game ranger, even wildlife documentary, uh, they'll talk about you know, the cheetah's tail is a counterweight, it's heavy, things like that. Um, people will also say things like it's used as a rudder, um, but there's actually not any data out there to prove any of that. So in 2014, me, an engineer, was invited to an autopsy of some cheetahs, and what we discovered sort of by surprise, is that the cheetah's tail is way lighter than we expected. And also, it's way th you know, skinnier and thinner. Okay, but interestingly, most of the tail volume was made up of fur, so it has a really bushy tail. Um, so what I did was, we placed the cheetah fur in a wind tunnel, and we showed that the, the wind, the wind uh, against the tail can actually be used by the cheetah in order to be able to stabilize and maneuver. So that's really cool. And what is even cooler is that it can, it can make it appear like a larger body without having this heavy thing that it needs to carry around when it's hunting. So it, it really kind of makes sense. And on my sabbatical at Carnegie Mellon University, working some colleagues from the US, we sort of extended that idea to a robot. So that's a robot with a lightweight tail. I think it was 1% of its body mass. And it's able to you know, flip around in the air. Then the other thing that we do in my group is to you know, try and understand motion from the idea of simulation. So you can often consider, and, and biologists know this, and us as engineers know that motion can be understood through a, as an optimization problem. And what they, that what they say is it's, it's considered a constrained optimization. So the challenge that I had, though, because usually optimizations are done with a, uh, you know, with knowing what the contact order is. So if we know walking, we know that, for example, we go right foot first, then we put our left foot down, and repeat. Or running, you know, same thing, but just we have like, we jump into the air, also we have a flight phase. But if you look at that video <laughs> on the side there, like what is the contact order we need to do in order to perform a turn or, you know, a deceleration because the cheat is sliding, is it using both its feet, using one foot, really, really complex problems. So what we really want is an, an algorithm which I uh, developed also on my sabbatical at Carnegie, um, which can basically uh, create motion purely um, using the physics of, of the model, but also taking into account the contacts. So if it's better to use both feet, it will do that. If it's better to first slide on the one foot, it will do that, but it all comes out of the optimization. And I worked with some uh, really, really uh, smart guy, Larry Bigler, on the side there. So, in order to, I know that's a lot of math speak, so what does it mean? So it means that we can take a model, I don't know if you guys can see, that's a, that's a model for a humanoid or even a human. So we can say, here's a human, uh, humanoid robot, it has an ankle uh, and has a heel and a toe contact and it has two legs and I want you to start standing upright at uh, the origin, that's zero, and we want you to go all the way to 10 meters and end uh, at a standstill, straight up. And then we want you to do that maneuver with the minimal amount of energy, so using the least amount of energy. So I didn't tell it anything about walking, you know, to go right foot, left foot, or use heel, toe, anything like that. I just said, obey physics and perform this task. And what's amazing is what pops out is a motion like this. 
which really is quite amazing to me that that's the mathematically optimal thing to do, is to do a little walk and then a little skip at the end. Um, so, so this algorithm we developed is obviously has applic applications in robotics, but also in biology and then surprisingly in animation. But um, the place I've spent sort of the most amount of my time working on is to understand what are real animals doing? Like, how are they moving? So if, if <laughs> things were different, I could take this cheetah and I could put it in a biomechanics lab on a treadmill in, in front of a, a fancy motion capture system. But obviously, I can't do that because it's a wild animal. <laughs> um, so wh what we did is we first looked at, you know, some many of you may know from wildlife documentaries, you have these collars that they can put around their necks. Um, but the problem with a GPS collar is that it takes this animal, so you can see that animal over there, it has all this articulation of its legs, its spine, the tail, and the head, and basically makes it look like that. So you've lost all of the information about the, how the head is being stabilized, what legs it's using to turn, and of course the stuff I'm interested, the tail. Um, so we can't use a collar. So what I thought of is, what if I put more sensors on the animal? So uh, we developed this harness system, which is essentially a harness around the cheetah, you can see there, which has a, a motion capture um, inertial measurement unit, the same thing you have in your phone that, you know, when you turn your phone, it flips the, flips the screen, uh, a GPS, and then we also had cameras on the cheetah. And then we took um, our knowledge of, of kinematics, and what's amazing is that we can now reconstruct the motion of the cheetah without having any cameras pointing at it. So the cheetah could run around freely, do its own thing, um, and if you want to see what it's like to ride on the back of a cheetah, this is what it looks like. <laughs> So this was taken at the Anne van Dyck Cheetah Center out in Pretoria. This is not sped up. <laughs> okay, so yeah, as part of the enrichment, the, the cheetahs actually chase around a little piece of rabbit pelt or plastic on a track just to kind of keep them exercising. Um, so yeah, that was, that was great. But the problem is, as you can imagine, they are cats. It was too invasive. So even though I got a cool paper and a patent out of it, uh, it wasn't quite what I, what I needed. So I needed to think about something else. So we approached GoPro, and they were very kind to give us uh, 12 cameras, and we stuck them into um, an enclosure and observed uh, cheetah exercise runs for three years um, at those two centers at the top there. So what I didn't know at the time, because I took all of this data on my sabbatical, is this is a really hard problem to do motion capture outside without having you know, any markers or control of the subject. So anybody who does any kind of biological research with humans, you can mostly tell humans to do, you know, can you walk in this line now, and then I want you to lift your arm, or things like that. We can't do any of that stuff. So a really challenging problem from a computer vision and a machine learning perspective. You can see on the right-hand side, this is just some of the types of images we got. So, you know, in, in summer, uh, the, the cheetah is basically the same color as the grass in the bottom right there. Uh, the, uh, sometimes in winter changes, you know, the lighting. Also, we had different breeds, uh, a subspecies of cheetah. The bottom left is a king cheetah, which is a variant, which kind of looks like uh, all the, 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 the spots have converged to look like stripes in some cases. And, of course, the biggest thing was we didn't have markers. So if you've ever seen them make, you know, any of the Marvel movies, you'll see them wearing those nice suits or the little blobs that they can do motion capture with. We can't do any of that stuff for the cheetahs. So uh, I teamed up with some really uh, um, smart neuroscientists uh, from EPFL um, in Switzerland, and we, we, we came up with this, with this really cool uh, system which was to uh, essentially do motion capture outside in the wild. So what it looks like is we have a deep learning algorithm which can look at six views of the cheetah which you'll see now. So the cheetah does a cool motion like that, and then we take a deep lab cut, which we can label, you can see there, it labels each of the joints, so it will automatically label the shoulder and the tail and the head and everything. And then we can, we can actually create a full-on skeleton model outside in an uncontrolled environment. So that, so that was really, really cool. Um, for, from a motion capture perspective. Cool. So, 
So the cheetahs that I worked with, uh, as I said, they, they're captive, they're from breeding centers, and even you saw riding on the back of the cheetah seemed very fast, but they're kind of lazy, actually. Um, so because they know they're going to be fed, they only really run at about 18 meters per second. Put that into perspective, wild cheetahs run at about 29 meters per second. Um, so extremely, extremely fast. So I needed to get better data. So I thought, you know, wild animals, if you watch animal documentaries, they really go go for it, and they turn, and they slide, and they do whatever they have to do in order to capture prey. So I needed to capture wild animal locomotion. And that's sort of a, a system I pitched to Google where we said, what if we could do non-contact, remote wildlife pose estimation? So um, I partnered with, um, with Google, and this is what I got the, the Research Scholar Award, as well as uh, my host, Andrew Markham, from the University of Oxford, and we developed a system called Wild Pose, which can essentially look at a wild animal. As you can see on the left, you have a view, and it can reconstruct the skeleton from like really far away. So we're talking 100 to 200 meters away. I hope many of you go and see the national parks when you're here, by the way. We have the best animals. Um, so yeah, that's the system on the left. It's a full mechatronic uh, design. As you can see, I am using my, my knowledge of robotics. And then that's the system. Um, being deployed out in Kalahari National Park, which is a big national park on the border of Namibia and Botswana and South Africa. Um, and that's it on the Game Rangers Bucky, actually. So we were really lucky. We went for uh, two trips last year. So we got to see lions. We got to see uh, giraffes, zebras, springbok fighting. You can see uh, those really, really cool images on the left, which I think most of you would get if you go there. But what we got, which is very really cool, is on the bottom right is we get these LIDAR point clouds. So LIDAR is like radar, but with a laser. So we can actually build, you can see the, a 3D model of the animal we're observing. So that's just a giraffe walking. That's about 150 to 200 meters away. And now with the image that we have, with a high-speed camera and the LIDAR point cloud, we can now reconstruct its 3D shape. So, so then another thing we got on our first day there, and the, uh, the um, game ranger was very jealous because she said she, she's been there for 10 years and she's seen about two cheetah kills, is that on our first day, we managed to witness a cheetah mother and a three cubs taking down a springbok, which we also captured with our system. So on the left, you see the high-speed camera footage. And on the right-hand side, that's the LiDAR point cloud, which you can now fuse together to get uh, 3D, 3D motion capture. OK. So you may ask yourself, OK, it's really cool research, and it's fun, and it's, and it's exciting. But, but what, what does it mean for? Africa, right? So I want to give you a case study uh, on why it is important to do this kind of exploratory research. So in my, in my research so far, we've shown that we can capture what the animals are doing. So what, you know, it's motion, it's speed, all those kinds of things. But we don't know how it does that, OK? So what we really need is what's called kinetics, which is the forces on the ground that it makes and the torques on its joint in order to be able un to understand you know, things like injury, things like uh, energy efficiency, and even evolutionary biology. So if you think of it, on the, we want to be able to look at a cheetah and be able to get you know, the torques on its joints and the forces it's making on the ground. OK. So it's usually done in a biomechanics lab, like most of this research. I, chosen a very difficult problem. So we take a, you, you have a human subject, an athlete, and you say, uh, we want you to run, or we want to check your gait, so can you walk? Um, and we need you to walk exactly on the force plate in our lab, right? So it's usually about a half a meter by one meter long. So you can see why that's going to be a problem. <laughs> so if we have this wild animal, how are we going to get it to actually run exactly on this small patch of land? Right? So it, it, it's sort of a needle in a haystack problem. So then I had, an, I had this idea. What if I cover the entire area in force-sensitive sensors? But then I quickly discovered that a force plate goes for about 50,000 US dollars per square meter. So it would be completely impossible for me to, to do that. Um, so this is sort of where, what I want to get at is that we often have to innovate, and this problem drives innovation, is that I then patented a new method of measuring 3D force from a plate. And it's an order of magnitude cheaper 
than, than the current system, so it's the, the patent on the left. And UCT is actually spinning a company out on this called the Cenotech, with me as the, uh, the director. And what we're hoping to do is to make biomechanics more accessible to everyone. So inadvertently, I have developed a system which can now be deployed and applied to make uh, you know, accessible uh, rehabilitation you know, for everyone. So applications in biomedical, sports science, obviously orthopedics, and, and robotics. So that's the, the, what the plate looks like on the right-hand side there. And then in the, in the last couple slides, I just want to talk about the thing that I'm really excited about, and if you're interested, I can talk for days about this, is, is health monitoring. So we all know, I know we don't want to talk about COVID, but, <laughs> but we know that you know, our world is a lot more connected than we thought. So, you know, especially now due to climate change, due to our populations expanding, our, us and our animals are being in contact with wildlife a lot more often than, than we think. And we know from COVID that these, you know, diseases can go from animals and wildlife into our domestic animals or straight to us. And actually how I got into this was that the South African National Parks said that the lions are getting diseases from domestic animals and it's wiping out prides, but they have no way of determining if a lion is sick or not until it's too late. Because the current methods of monitoring health are way too invasive. They need to tranquilize an animal, draw its blood, really dangerous. Um, the collars that they have cannot provide this information and camera traps only give you know, pictures and cool videos like I've shown. But uh, there's been some recent work in uh, autonomous driving, self-driving cars, where human health can be monitored completely remotely in a, in a vehicle. But it's, it's extremely expensive. You know, it requires the person to sit still, which we don't have with wild animals. And importantly, it requires lots of big data, which, you know, what is the heart rate of a lion? What does it look like, its internal body temperature from a thermal camera? We don't know that. So my goal, I would say in the next five years, is to develop a system where we look at an animal, say a lion or a bat or a bird, because they carry H5N1, and be able to determine in a non-contact way what's, what its heart rate, what its breathing rate is, what its body temperature is, how it's moving, any subtleties in its motion. And then, because we can't just, how do we know what a healthy lion's heart rate is? Interestingly enough, they don't know. They only know like when a lion's tranquilized. Um, is then to develop what's called digital twin models, which are essentially a computer model for the behavior of this animal, and then determine in July in Khalakhadi, a lion usually has a body temperature of so much. So you measuring 41 degrees, it should be 39. There's something wrong. Now we should intervene and do something more invasive. But the first step to that is we need data, which we don't have. So what I've done at the moment is, and the stuff I'm doing at Oxford is, my students over here have developed this multimodal motion capture system, which has cameras, LIDAR, thermal images, which pick up heat, high-speed cameras, obviously, an event camera, which is a very fancy camera, which picks up the changes in light, and then a millimeter wave radar. And we've now recently tested this, so this is multimodal data from cheetahs, you can see Top right is the thermal image. You can see the face is quite warm. The bottom left is the event camera, which only picks, picks up changes in light. And the bottom right is the LiDAR point cloud. So um, we really, in Cape Town, in South Africa, we are uniquely positioned to solve and study this problem. And what I like about it is that it highlights the limitations of our current technologies. and in sort of forces us to innovate and reimagine the way things are done. Um, and it's, I, don't, I didn't set out to design a biomechanics or biomedical application or an, an animation application, but they really have you know, these emergent uh, applications in obviously robotics, but things like biomechanics, sports science, um, you know, across the field. So yeah, thank you very much for your time and I'm happy to talk about this later.